is yours. Thanks again, Miss Selfie. Uh, before we dive into the section, I'd like to uh, give a short introduction about Linda. Hello, Linda. Good to see you. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce Linda to all participants. Hello. Dr. Linda Hannington taught English as a foreign language in the UK, Germany, Austria, and Spain prior to moving to Singapore in 18, uh, in 1987. Sorry. Not that old. Just since we're extensively with Singapore school teachers and other professionals. In addition to her doctoral degree, she has an MA in education, training and development and an MBA in strategic management. Double degree, right, Linda? And uh, during her career, she has held a range of training and management positions. Her last full-time position was a senior lecturer at the National Institute of Education Singapore, where she worked for nine years. She is currently a freelance ELP consultant. Her research interests include teacher professional development of CPD, oral communication skills, pronunciation, and learner autonomy. So without any further delay, please welcome our speaker, Dr. Linda Hannington. Linda, the screen is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to see you all. I'd like to go straight into my presentation, so I'll, I'll do my shared screen now. Okay, can you all see my screen? Dr. Sandri, can you see my screen? Yes, Linda, I can okay. see your screen. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, and I'm looking forward, as I say, to talking to you. So um, the topic that I'm going to look at is a particular part of listening uh, linked to my interest in pronunciation, actually. So it's about decoding. So um, I'll just show you this screen. I've worked in a lot of different places. You can see all the different countries. And as um, Dr. Sandri said, most recently in Singapore, and actually I'm now retired, so I work freelance. Okay, so my session today, I want to just situate listening as part of the communication process, and then look at, in particular at decoding as part of, a listen, of one of the listening skills, and look at what is involved and how we can help our students. And then um, at the end, there should be time for a short Q&A. Uh, I think it's, uh, yes, okay. So listening as part of the communication process. So we typically talk about four skills, right? Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So situated within those four skills, we need to look at the interactions between the participants. So have a little think, you know, what happens when people have a conversation? What does the speaker have to do? What does the listener have to do? Is this a one-way transaction? Or is it a two-way transaction? Why do you think that? All right, so I'd like to show you um, a model. There have been various models of communication. There have been linear models suggesting that it's a one-way thing, but that, that was quickly replaced into an interactional model where we looked at communication as a two-way um, interaction. But the most uh, common model that we use today is actually a transactional model. This is not new at all, but it is something that informs a lot of communication skills courses. Okay, so maybe take a look at this model and have a think about the things that you can see in the uh, diagram, and then we'll talk about it very briefly. Okay, so in, in Barlow's model, when he talks about a transactional model, you've got one or more participants, the communicators, and each of those people bring to the communication all the baggage that they have acquired, the culture, the background, their age, their education, how they're feeling, even financial security and so on. And the communicator encodes the message using his or her language resources. 
the, the receiver decodes that message using his or her experience, background, and language resources. And in this model, Barnland identifies different kinds of noise, which he sees as barriers to communication. And actually, it's one of these barriers that we're looking at really today. Physical barriers, if you're feeling cold or tired, that can impact your communication. Intrapersonal uh, barriers, it could be how you're feeling if you're anxious or something like this. Interpersonal is how you feel about the other people with whom you're interacting. And then semantic is looking at language sides, which we will look at in particular because this is a, a language teaching seminar. So in terms of noise, in terms of listening, uh, the language related noises can be to do with meaning and they can be to do with the language itself. So I'll just do a little digression on the meaning side before we look at the, the language side. So this is just for fun, right? This is semantic meaning, right? I'm from the UK, so I'm British. So if I say that's not bad, what do I mean? What might a learner understand? If I say, I'll bear it in mind, what might I mean? What might a learner understand? You must come for dinner. Do I mean you should come for dinner? And if you are researchers, and this has happened to me too, uh, if I write on uh, your research paper, I only have a few minor comments. What does that mean? Okay, so here we go. So if I say these things, this, is, this could be what a learner would understand. But this might be indeed what I mean. So there is the whole area of meaning in language which you build up with your students as you are developing their proficiency. Okay. So if we're looking at linguistic barriers and where we can really in, uh, take action as teachers, we, we, build, we build up our students' language proficiency generally. We need to expose them to language variety. So we need to allow them to hear people with different language backgrounds speaking English because English is much more widely used as an international language than with native speakers like myself, for example. Um, and then we need to think about the pace. And then the thing that I'm going to focus on today the ability to decode. And um, some time ago, Dr. Willie, who spoke last time, right? And um, Dr. Willie Ranyanja and uh, a colleague, they wrote a paper um, talking about the general problems that students face with the perception that in a foreign language teacher, the tape is too fast. Okay. At this point, I have to ask you, am I talking too fast for you or is it okay? Dr. Sandra, am I okay, Speed? I think you're okay, Linda. Okay, good, all right. Yeah, the, the, the speed is okay. <laughs> okay, I'll continue then. Okay, so we're going to look now at the ability to decode. And this is a focus on pronunciation, which is an area I have worked in a lot during my career. Okay, so decoding spoken language. I'm going to say two phrases and I'd like you to write them down. I'm not going to say them actually, I'm going to play them because otherwise you can sometimes lip read. Okay, so here's the first one. Can you try and write this down? I'm all ears. Okay, I'll play it again. I'm all ears. Okay, that's the first one. This is the second one. First of all. First of all. Okay, we will come back to these as we, as we go on and, and look at why, not you I don't think, but your learners may have difficulty decoding such utterances. Um, I used, a model there that was online. And I would highly recommend when you're doing 
anything like this with listening, that you do have recordings. Um, the reason being that a recording will be constant, whereas all of us, when we repeat things, we tend to vary. Yeah, so you need a constant recording. Uh, they're flexible. You can replay them many times. Um, students can use re-listen re to them at home, and you know we can repeat them as often as we need. Okay, so what do we need to decode? We're going to look at four areas. Uh, firstly, sounds. Secondly, a, a principal area of of concern for me is word boundaries. <clears throat> and then we will look at rhythm and stress and at intonation patterns. Okay, sounds. So give him a pet, give him a pat. Give him a pet, uh, sorry, give him a pat, give him a pet. It's coal, it's cold. Often students can't distinguish. And my first one that, one of those things that I asked you to write down, did I say, or did you hear, First of all, or festival. Yeah. Um, it's not just about uh, consonants and sounds within the words. Uh, it can also be grammatical. They watch TV, they watched TV. If the students can't hear the ED ending pronounced as a T here, then they're unlikely to use it actually themselves and they're unlikely to use it in their, in their own writing but they also don't know whether we're talking about present tense or the past tense. So awareness of sounds is a first place to start. So as teachers, we can pr provide a lot of sound discrimination practice. I'm sure you do this already. Um, and there are plenty of online resources. I, one very well-known one is Ship and Sheep. Um, so you can have a look at that one. And there are many others. Um, I would argue that students need to be able to discriminate sounds hourly. In other words, they, they need to be able to hear the different sounds before you can expect them to be able to produce them. But we're particularly listening, uh, we're particularly talking about listening today. This is John Wells. I mean, the, the big pro one of the big problems with English is the mixture of consistency and inconsistency. And the consistencies mean that phonics is worth doing. Inconsistencies give rise to many difficulties. And one of the difficulties is this uh, issue of uh, decoding in listening. So, you know, in English, we have um, more than one possibility for some sounds, right? So the first sound that were there, there could be written in three different ways, depending on the context. The second one, the air, can be spelt as in care, as in fair, as in where. The vowel sound is the same. But so the students need to, um, your students need to know that these sounds that they hear may be represented in different kinds of spelling. And again, with the, the E sound, sheep, peace, please, again, different possibilities. Now, this is a bit daunting for us all as teachers, as learners, but there are regularities. And this is, these are from um, Adam Brown, who has done a lot of research in pronunciation. And you can see here that for these short sounds, the short vowel sounds, there is quite a lot of regularity. In particular, the A ah sound, the A, the single A, making the A ah sound, and the, uh, the O in spelling, making the O sound. But some of the others you can see, there's not a great deal of um, regularity. When it comes to the long vowel sounds, they tend to spell their names, we say. So A, we call it the letter A, will be um, set, will pr pronounce the word face, yeah? E, seen, mice, mice. And these ones will often have a silent E to make the longer uh, vowel sound. So we can encourage our, our students to recognize different sounds and different possibilities right from the start. So this is a little story um, at primary school level, okay? Is the wise owl wise? And after, Doing this story with students or any, any similar text with students, 
you might want to consider some, some sounds. There's a lot of letter O's in this particular text, right? So I might just go through and say, okay, can you tell me all the way, all the words that have the O oh sound in it, O. Oh. So the students would say pond, forest, frogs, and so on, right? Now I say, okay, well, are there any other sounds where we can see an O? So we've got one, yeah, one summer. Uh, have we got an OO sound? Do, for example, yeah? So is a different one. And then finally, in owl, we have another sound. So just highlighting these different sounds that can occur um, linked to the same, what looks like the same spelling. So uh, student awareness raising throughout is, is very important. There was a pond in the forest and in the pond lived many frogs. One summer, it didn't rain. All the water in the pond dried up. The frogs got very hot. What shall we do, they said. Let's go and ask Owl. He'll tell us what to do. He looks so wise. He looks so clever. So they went and asked Owl. Okay. Um, we we'll move on to consonants. They tend to be more regular, but um, the K spelling is, is one tricky one. We can have K for kite with a K, K for car with a C, and then these particularly tricky words that are longer, accept, accent, accommodation, accept, excellent, and then finally, queen and quiet. But generally speaking, the consonants are more regular in their pronunciation. Okay, here's a little sound riddle to do with the s and uh, k sound, right? So, you can eat cakes and drink coke in me. I'm not a cafe and you can find me in many schools. My name begins with the same letter as cinema, city and certificate. I'm a, I'm a what? Anybody know? I think you can't say anything actually, right? So it's canteen, yeah? So here you get the students to circle all the words beginning with C and uh, raise awareness that these can be pronounced in two different ways. Yeah. So again, so, so that when they're listening, they can anticipate, what do I hear compared with what I might know in writing? Okay, let's look at word boundaries. So sounds also change depending on their context. So listen to this sentence and think about why it might be difficult for learners to decode. A two eggs, an apple and an ant. Okay. I'll play it one more time. A two eggs, an apple and an ant. Okay. So what did you hear? A two eggs, an apple and an ant. Okay. So the first part was I ate two eggs, two eggs actually, because the eggs starts with a vowel and therefore there can be some sounds joining up. So if we have, we can say we have one egg, yeah. But when we come to two, we have two eggs. There's a w in there, two eggs. So students may not realize that that's actually still two words. They hear it as one, yeah? When we come to three, three eggs, we put a y in to make the link, three eggs. And then four, um, in my English, British English, I don't have any R sound there until I link it up with four eggs. Now an R sound comes in. Uh, Americans and other, other um, speakers of English may have an R in the four, yeah? but British English we don't. Okay, so there's different ways of linking up. And again, students, they need to know this in a sense so that they can see, okay, it's not, it's not just one word, it's two words that have been linked together. One egg, two eggs. Three eggs, four eggs, one egg, two eggs, three eggs, four eggs. So one is the careful pronunciation and the other one is the natural pronunciation or my natural pronunciation. 
So what I said earlier was an apple and an ant, yeah? So students will he often hear napple and nant, yeah? Because, uh, so, and the first ones that I also asked you to write down, I don't know what you wrote down, but I said, I'm all ears. You, students may hear, I'm more ears, I'm more ears, because of the y in there and the m moving over. And the last one, first of all versus festival, that comes from real life experience. I was teaching some students and after a few weeks, they said to me, oh, Miss Linda, why do you always start the lesson with festival? What are they talking about? And I realized that I was saying, first of all, and they were hearing and understanding festival as one word because they didn't realize I had three words linking together. So things that can happen are deletion. I've deleted my D on an, and my consonants and sounds are reduced to a schwa sound, yeah? So, so this makes decoding hard, even though the words themselves will be very familiar to the students. So typical sounds that are deleted are H's, T's, and D's. Sometimes we have sounds that come similar to other ones. So we have green and park and green. You put them together and you get green park. Good and boy, put them together, you get good boy. When we have hand and bag or bag and hand, but we have handbag. So these sounds change as we uh, put the words together using assimilation. Again, students need to have some awareness of this so that they can decode what they're hearing. How do we help learners? Well, being consciously aware that there is some linking going on me and showing them what's happening is, is a first start. So on the board, I would show something like first to ball. So how those sounds, the consonant sounds at the ends of the words move over to the beginning of the next part. I would also show them where there might be deletion. So an and ant. I, would use, I often use my fingers to do this and show how uh, things come together. So I've got here first of all, first of all. So using your hands, using visuals helps the learners to understand how this is, uh, what is happening. Another thing that I found very useful, um, and actually this is how I realized that students were having problems, um, was with mini dictations. So, and focusing on particular areas where there is likely to be some linking up. Again, I would recommend using recordings. So let's say you had a recording about some shopping and went to get some, some eggs and some apples. And two ways of doing the dictation. In the beginning, you might want to give an indication of how many words the students are looking to hear. And then later, you encourage them to work out how many words they are hearing themselves and what those words are. So dictation is a very useful um, thing, but. Uh, skill, uh, uh, very useful activity, but you need to keep them quite short and focused. At this point, I also want to say um, what is important for intelligibility and what is not. And these things that I've been talking about, really they are more important for decoding, for understanding the language of other people, the English language, English language of other people. Does a learner need to um, put all these features in place themselves? No, I would argue not. The link up, it's not something they need to do. Uh, if the listener can hear this, the individual words, that's absolutely fine. But when they are listening to people who do use these features, they need to be able to decode. Okay, let's move quickly on to rhythm and stress. Um, <clears throat> so because English is a stress time language, as you know, we have a regular beat. And that means that the syllables between the beats tend to be reduced. So I'm going to show you a poem in a minute. So it goes, who smiled as she rode on a tiger. So smiled, rode, tiger will get the beats. And these are the content words which get stressed so a listener can hear them. And usually important or new information tends to 
get the main stress in an utterance. Okay. So everything between, sorry, I go back. Everything between those words gets reduced, all right? So how do we help our students become used to listening to the rhythm of English? Lots of listening, poems, songs, rhymes, all these can help the students to get used to hearing the rhythm of English. And if they're seeing the words, they start to see how they may be uh, weakened, combined. And if you want to improve, improve their own fluidity, they can sing along or they can recite. And the good thing, of course, is the words for all poems, wrong, science, songs and rhymes these days can be found online. Okay, so my limerick. Okay. I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to play it to you. There was a young lady of Liger who smiled as she rode on a tiger. They came back from the ride with the lady inside and a smile on the face of the tiger. Mm -hmm. So my first question to you is, why was the tiger smiling? And the answer is, of course, the tiger ate the lady. So this is also a point you really need to try to help students get the general meaning before you start to focus on any features of language. Okay, so this sad story is a very useful one for showing some of the features. So have a think about which words seem to link to the next ones. Okay, I'll play one more time. Sorry. There was a young lady of Liger who smiled as she rode on a tiger. They came back from the ride with the lady inside and a smile on the face of the tiger. Okay. So did you hear something like this? So the highlighted parts are where it's very likely that, that uh, the final consonant sound of the previous word will move over to the beginning of the, the word that starts with uh, a vowel sound. Okay, so many functional words don't have any stress. So the vowel is reduced to the, the schwa sound. So that adds to the issues with decoding. So examples of these, can you identify some? That would be the uh, yeah? There was a young lady and an of is of, right? Um, let's go back further down and uh, the, yeah? And further down and the smile and this would also be a schwa. So there are quite a lot of schwa sounds on the functional words here in this text in any text. Okay, so that's really looking at uh, sounds and then the way we link up in our rhythm and stress. Okay, just a few more minutes on intonation. Okay, what is intonation? Okay, so it's a change in pitch and it's linked to conveying meaning. So let's think about the kinds of meanings that can be conveyed by pitch changes. Um, it doesn't change the basic meaning, unlike in Chinese, for example, but it can change the implied meaning. And le learners, listeners have to decode these meanings. So in these two utterances, one, I have a falling tone, the other, I have a rising tone. What does it result in, in terms of meaning? He needs some money. Yeah. So you can see the first one is a statement, but the second one has a rise and it's a question. So intonation, we identify, research has identified four different functions. So the accentual function, grammatical function, discourse function, and attitude function. So in the accentual function, we stress what we consider to be important. So here is a sentence. How would you normally say this? Say it to yourselves. Now, if we change the stress, how does the message change? Let's try. So, I'm working tomorrow. 
means I'm working, but you may not be. I am working tomorrow. Yeah? I'm working tomorrow. I'm working tomorrow. So again, where we place our, our main stress has an important impact on the meaning that our listener will understand or should understand. Okay. Um, this is a real life one where somebody stressed some sentences wrongly and ended up spending the rest of his life with me because I thought he wanted to have dinner with me, but he didn't. He just wanted me to go out for dinner with him and some other people. I'll skip that one. So intonation and grammar. So we just talked, we had an example of this. I need to do my homework. I need to do my homework. And you haven't done your homework. Uh, sorry, you, you've done your homework, haven't you? You've done your homework, haven't you? And we know, you all know that tags can, tag questions can be confirmation with a falling tone or a real question with a rising tone. So there's a link here, one link here with intonation and grammar. Another one, uh, looking at discourse. Uh, the question here is, have you, has the, has the speaker finished, right? I'm going to play these and you can decide. He bought a book and a pen. He bought a book and a pen. Okay, can you hear the difference in those two? I went two? there yesterday. I went there yesterday. Okay. One more time. Hear the difference between the two, ver uh, the two versions. He bought a book and a pen. He bought a book and a pen. I went there yesterday. I went there yesterday. So you can probably note that when the voice falls, the speaker has finished, but when the voice is rising, then there's going to be something else that follows. So the speaker has not finished. And this is again, very important to be able to decode in interactions. And then the last one about attitude. Okay. So at the custom, somebody might say to you the first utterance, and then the second one you might say to a friend, I guess. What's your name? Is he really that handsome? Mm -hmm. So the falling tone on what's your name is a routine question. And is he really that handsome? So intonation showing, expressing interest or surprise or, or even doubt. Hmm? Okay. What's your name? Is he really that handsome? Okay, so helping learners, um, again, is about awareness raising um, in terms of the accentual, especially, especially thinking about the impact of stressing function words, which happens very often in learners around this region. Uh, also, it, we, it's very useful to get students to interpret. So asking them what's important in a sentence or an utterance, asking whether they're hearing a question or a statement, asking whether they think the, the speaker has finished or how the speaker's feeling. So different ways of sensitizing them to the, what the, the meanings that the speaker is trying to convey with their pronunciation and aspects of pronunciation. So decoding. Okay. All right, that's it from me. So I, we talked a little bit about the communication process and then we've looked at the importance of decoding as a listening skill. So in terms of sounds, word boundaries, rhythm and stress and intonation patterns. Okay, um, Dr. Santri, do you want me to take questions now or right at the end of everybody? Uh I think uh, you can take questions now, Dr. Linda. How much uh, time do I have? Because you said half an hour. I think I've done about half yeah, an hour. Yeah, half an hour, but you still have 10 minutes for Q&A. Oh, 10 minutes for Q&A. So what are the students oh. going to do? What are the participants going to do as Q&A? They're going to... Uh, they, they, they will have to chat in the chat room. So whenever chat they have questions, they will have, they will have to chat. They will have to type on the chat room. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, just show you, um, these are my references, okay? All right, I'll stop, I'll stop sharing now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Linda Hannington for 
your presentation. It's really great to know every detail about teaching and learning listening. Now, in uh, guiding you with Q&A sections, I will invite uh, Christine. Christine, please. It's your turn to guide Dr. Linda in the section of Q&A. Okay. Am I audible? Hello, yes, we can hear you. Hello, Christine. Okay, thank you, Miss Linda. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a quick introduction before we get into the questions. So my name is Christine Ismael, and I was given this a uh, precious chance to take this Q&A session. So uh, I'm going to read the question given by the participants and Miss Linda, you may answer the question right after that. Okay. Uh, the first question comes from Miss Linda Rupidara. <laughs> Another Linda. <laughs> English speakers come from different countries or nations and the way they speak English may be affected by particular accents that may be that maybe we are not familiar with. Do you think that the accents of the speakers could interrupt the decoding process? Hello, Linda, and everybody else. Um, yes, uh, well, I, the thing I do think is that we need to expose our students and ourselves to um, English language speakers with different backgrounds from both so-called native speakers and non-native speakers, because as I said earlier today, we're often interacting with two non-native speakers of English are interacting with each other. Yes, of course, individual variations of English will impact on the, uh, on the way English is pronounced, to what extent some of those things that I was talking about will happen. Uh, they're very, they're, they are quite often features of a traditional native speaker, I would say. So, so while it is important to teach, uh, to help students with decoding in, in different contexts, it's also very important for them to hear um, different kinds of um, different accents so that they, they become more flexible with their ability to decode, actually, yes. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Linda, for the answer. Next question comes from Mr. Agustinu Semyon. Do you agree if the teachers of English focus the materials to teach listening on words or similar pronunciation, just like and, on, and and? To me, this is important to avoid ambiguity on one side and to decode and encode exactly during the communication or interaction on the other. Um, I think what I've been talking about is, is just one small aspect of all the things that we teach. Um, when, you're, when you're teaching listening, you, you, of course, you want the students to understand the main messages. And then you can um, go further and look at issues of pronunciation, such as these similar words, yeah, and heighten awareness with the students. But we have, as, I mean, as English language teachers, we have a lot to do. So it's just something that I would... Um, bring in, usually for, you know, maybe a few minutes at the end of a listening, um, just constant, like a, a drip feed so that the students become more aware of these features. Mm. Does that help? That's the Augustus. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Linda. Uh, so the last question comes from Miss Santri Pejahimo. The question is, uh, my students concern so much on accents. What should I do to direct them with this issue? <laughs> the okay i i'm not sure if i'm understanding this correctly um that they're concerned about their accent um what i would say is all speakers of english reflect their backgrounds and you know what we want to do is we want to help our students to become intelligible to other speakers of english the people that they they want to interact with so Although, I mean, I sound British. Your students will sound as though from come from Indonesia. But if we can understand each other and we can communicate well and we have the language, that would be more, much more important than them trying to sound like me, for example. I mean, which is sometimes 
sometimes sometimes students do tell me, oh, I want to sound like you, Linda. I say, no, you don't. <laughs> so they want to sound like themselves and where they come from, but they want to be intelligible in English. So that's what I would, I, that's what I would encourage them to think about, really. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Thank you so much, Miss Linda, for answering the question. So I guess this is the, the end of Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much for answering all the questions. And also thank you for taking your time to be here with us in this webinar. Thank mm. you, Miss. Thank you very much for having me today. It's been yeah. lovely to meet you all. Yes, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank uh, you, Dr. The, <laughs> the last question was for me, actually. I mean, oh, it was from you. <laughs> oh, so it was. Yeah, it's a big issue in my class, you know, I'm teaching, speaking, and all my students concern so much about the action. Yeah, so and, what do you yeah. tell them? Well, I said, like, if you have different background, especially different uh, first language or mother tongue, it's going to be difficult to, you know, some people are good in imitating, like, if you are so favorite in a previous action that some people are really good in imitating yeah, that action true. or Australian mm -hmm. action or even American action, but some are not that lucky. Well, what I mean by not lucky, yeah, yeah, it means yeah. really don't have lucky. that particular talent. Yeah, too. quote unquote, right? Yeah. But uh, well, that's okay because now it's, you know, it's it's now like word Englishes. Everyone yeah, sings it, not yeah. only uh, people in British English. So don't worry about the action so much. That, that's exactly what I tell my students as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You just want to be able to understand you. Mm. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> Linda. Well, thank you for such an insightful presentation, Linda, related to listening skill. I'm sure it's really beneficial for us all here, both teachers and students. So if you want to stick around, and I, I do expect that you can yeah, stay I'll around. Stay, I'll stay here, yes. Yeah. yeah, for the closing statement at the end of all presentation. Thank you very much, Linda.